Hey everybody! Today, Rotto runs through Faron, but before I get going, please turn your subtitles on to the Klingon channel so that when I make rules goofs, you'll know what they are. And if you've done that, then welcome to Ancient Egypt, everybody, where we are the children of the great and mighty Pharaoh. Which means we're pretty much going to spend the entirety of our lives, five rounds, from babyhood to our death, preparing for the afterlife. That is what we are all about. And I'm going to be playing this solo today, which means it's me as a human player, you know, again, the child of the Pharaoh, up against the traitor, which is what this board is over here. Now, I've already got the traitor board set up, which is to say I've got them uh, lying randomly with one of the resource tokens on each one. And if you want to increase the difficulty of the solo game, you can flip more of these to the darker side, which makes the traitor tougher and tougher to beat. So I've only flipped one of them over. Okay, so the traitor is ready to go. We're in the first round, so the traitor has five of these jars. And um, the last thing I have to do as part of setup, which you do under any circumstances, draw a number of jars equal to the number of players plus one, which in this case is two, because there's only one child of the pharaoh. That's me. The traitor doesn't count. So I draw two, and now I'm going to pick one of these, and these represent the starting resources I will have available to it. Upon my birth, I could have two royalty and an architecture, or not architecture, agriculture, or I could have uh, royalty, construction, and um, what do you call that? Royalty, construction, and Trade. Blue is trade. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take one of these. I'll go on ahead and just give myself some variety. Now, the one I didn't take, or, uh, you know, and this only happens in a solo and a two-player game, the one that wasn't taken ends up blocking spaces on the board, because this is a worker placement game. Since uh, there were two royalty not taken, those royalty block these royalty worker placement spaces on the board, and one agriculture, which is where the green, over here. So now what that means is, and this is gone, uh, what that means is there is only one opportunity to visit the artisans this round. Because this is only for four more players, and these spaces have been gobbled up by random chance. There's two opportunities to work on our burial chamber, and three opportunities to visit the uh, nobles, three opportunities to get offerings from the people, and three opportunities to visit the Nile. Okay, so anyway, though, I get these starting resources. Trade, royalty and construction. So I gave myself some variety, but in doing that, I've also cut off my opportunity to uh, visit the scribes and have them write about how awesome I am. Okay, so anyway, so that's gone. And now two more of them come out, uh, because at the end of the round, I will end up collecting one of these, and the other one is going to determine what spaces are blocked off at the beginning of the second round when I enter my childhood. Okay, Game set up, ready to go. I am the first player, which means I'm worth three points at the end of the game if I can hold on to first player. So how does it work? Well, like I said, this is a worker placement game, and we've got all these different areas. Now, this rotates. So over the course of the game, different costs will be accrued to get into different areas. And since, this is interesting. Since there is only one shot to get in with the scribes, and you need royalty, and I have one royalty, my first move could be to um, visit the scribes by spending royalty. Now, it's not as simple as that, though. For all these areas, you've got to pay something to get into the area, and then you've got to pay the cost of actually doing the action there. So in the case of this, to, to actually um, get one of the scribes on my side, I have to um, give up three matching resources. And you might say, well, how can I do that? I've got two silver, I've got a trade, and I've got a con uh, construction. Silvers are wild, so they're very, very handy. So in theory, I could give up these two silver and a construction and say, hey, I've, I'm giving up three of a kind, and that means I could get one of these scribes, which could be worth 10 points, or 10 points, or three points plus three resources, or five points plus two resources, two silver. So I could spend that silver, get that silver right back, and get five points. That's pretty nice, but there's more to it than that. Remember how I paid one royalty to get in here? The entry cost you pay, which is you know either royalty, or, uh, what's it, justice is black, red is um, construction, green is agriculture, and blue is trade. The resource you spend as a worker to get into that zone can go towards the cost of what you're trying to do. So, if I had a total of three royalty on me, this would be my first one, and then my second and my third. Now, I effectively do have that. 
because, as I stated earlier, I've got two silver. So let's go for it. Let's go visit the scribes. Uh, that's one of the three I need to spend. Two, three, I'm going to spend some uh, silver. And now I get to snag one of these. Do I just go for the points and give up resources? I don't want that. So do I just get five points and get my silver right back? Or do I get three points and get one silver, one royalty? Hmm. Okay, I, I want more variety. I, I want more. I'm, I'm, I Basically, I've spent three tokens to get in here. And um, ah, you know, I'll just take the two silver. And I'm going to get two back out of it plus five points. So I get two silver back, basically. And I'm going to score this um, scribe at the end of the game. A new one immediately comes out. And it's another, it's another the exact same type of scribe. And my turn is done. That was super duper simple. It is now the trader's turn. Now the trader, uh, basically, like me, sends workers out to these zones, but the action the trader does is actually determined by their board. So let's look at this a little bit more closely. Uh, because this is the first round, it says five. The trader has five jars that were drawn randomly that are going to determine each turn what the trader is going to do. So let's draw the first one. The trader says, boom! Okay, first of all, the bottom resource, we grab one from the supply and fill up the uh, accompanied line. So we take an agriculture tile, a green one, we put it over here, and we have the uh, trader do whatever it says. In this case, the trader says, eliminate the middle um, noble. The, the, you know, the trader doesn't take it for themselves. Sometimes the trader takes them, like uh, this is grab the third noble, this is eliminated. So it's like you know somebody else got rid of the noble in the draft. So this noble is gone, out of the game. There goes my shot to get that noble who is worth three points plus three additional points for every noble I would have collected. Uh-uh. She's gone. The trader had her killed! Okay. But we're not done with the trader's turn yet. So first of all we do this. Uh, the bottom one. Now we look at these two. One of these two actions are going to uh, fill up a space on the board. Taking up another worker placement spot, the other action is going to fill up another one over here. So, now this is interesting. All of the uh, royalty spaces are filled up, so the trader cannot do this one, which means the trader must do trade and fill up a trade spot. So that's one less opportunity I have to visit the Nile now. And the trader is going to, in addition to doing this agriculture item, is going to do this royalty item, which is over here. Oh, by the way, a new... Uh, noble should have come out immediately. Over here, the traitor is now going to assassinate noble number three. Oh my goodness. What, what, were, what were you, number three? So noble number three would have been worth two points at the end of the game. And upon recruiting that noble, you get to increase your burial chamber level by one and get an offering. So that would have been nice, but that noble is no more. A new one get, replaces. And, let's see what else. Oh, eliminate another noble and eliminate one of the scribes. In this case, um, the highest value one. So it's either one of these tens. Uh, when there's multiples of equal value, it's the leftmost one. So this scribe! Oh, this nasty trader. And so another one comes out. At least the trader hasn't been taking any points for themselves. But anyway, so that is what the trader did. Blocked a space, did these two actions, which is basically just killing a bunch of stuff. And uh, this is now out of the game. That was the trader's turn. So you can see the trader does a lot of the same type of stuff. You know, uh, you know, drafts for things, uh, gets things, takes items, and also blocks worker placement spots on the board. Trader is done. It is now my second turn. And where am I going to go? Well, again, the one place I cannot go, I cannot do any more scribe action. So I've got to go someplace else. So what do I want to do? Well, um, since I, I, I want to save these uh, silver for like special occasions, as you might imagine, I probably want to do a blue action or a red action. Now, unfortunately, the red action, which is come over here and visit the uh, nobles, this is the most expensive thing that we can do in the game. Uh, because as you can see, we have to pay... Our cost to get in, which would be one red, and that could be one of the actual payment. The payment for doing noble stuff is one of each resource. So the red, I would, in addition to this red, I would also have to have a blue, a green, a black, and a yellow to be able to get one of these nobles. As you might imagine, influencing nobles is a tough thing. You have to really build up for it. So I'm clearly not going to do that this round. Um, but here's the thing: if I don't use this red this round, next round construction is going to be over here, and this red will let me move up 
on the um, what do you call it? My building, my burial chamber. But that's gonna. So I'm gonna save that red because it'll be in a good spot to be good to put to good use in the second round. So that means, well, I mean, don't forget. I do have wild cards, but I want to save these. So the other thing I've got is this one agriculture, which interestingly enough would let me come over here to build uh, the burial chamber. And this is not a good time to use agriculture to work on my burial chamber because this is just a straight up way to score points over the course of the game. Here I am starting, I have no burial chamber. Um, if I if I pay to get in, I then have to pay one red or construction and one uh, ro royalty to be able to move up one space, which is worth five points. And then in a future turn, I pay a green and a blue, move up again and again and again and again. Uh, I can get 60 points if I actually build a pyramid for myself over the course of my lifetime. In that last step, it's four of any resource I want. So here's the problem. If I use this green to get in here, the green cannot apply towards my standing cost of red or yellow. If I was already here, then it would make total sense for me to come here because, hey, to get to the next level, I need a green and a blue. Here's the green to pay in, and then here's the blue that I use, and I'd be able to go up again. So right now, this green and this uh, blue I've got, not so good. Wait a minute, do I have that blue? Yes. Did I just... What did I... No, I don't have a blue. Or yes, I do. Yeah. Ah! Yeah, yeah, I, I had a blue right from the get-go. So this blue is not so good. Oh, I'm sorry. Doing this green action makes no sense. Doing this red action makes no sense because I can't really afford to do anything with scribes. However, as I said, I do have a blue. So I could visit the Nile. There's still opportunities to go there by spending some trade. Now, if I come here, then I've got to decide which of these Nile actions I want. Since I paid a blue, I probably want to do this one because I've already paid the blue, now I just need a green. Or I just need a red. Um, and I happen to have a green and a red. So, with this, I've already paid for half of this action or this action. This action is get a royalty and a construction and move up on two, one or two tracks, the red or the blue. So I can move up twice on the blue or the red, or one on each of them. And the higher I move up on these, the more points I get at the end of the game. Three to make it to the middle, seven to make it to the top. Now instead, I could spend my blue plus the green I've got to do this. That gives me a justice and a wild card, and I move up on any one track I want. Let's do that. So I've spent my blue. I'm now going to spend this green... Uh, so that's the blue plus the green. So that gives me a justice and a third silver. Hooray. And I can move up on any track. Oh, what the heck. Uh, let's go on ahead and move up on the yellow track. Boom. All right. So I'm on my way. The first step doesn't do anything for me. But if I get to the second step before the game is over, that's three points or seven points if I make it all the way to the top. Okay, and then, yeah, this is really simple. These are just points to be had, turning uh, resources directly into points and other resources on the Nile. So that was my second turn, and I got all kinds of silver and five points. Hooray! I'm doing pretty well. It is now uh, the trader's turn. Let's see what the trader is up to. Boom! All right, trader says, I'm going to move up on my construction track, which means the trader takes the second offering from the offering board. So let's go on ahead and look at that. So uh, this is upside down. So you have to imagine this is the first, second, and third offering pair. These are you know, all the people of Egypt. They, you know, they worship me like a god. So of course they've come to make offerings. And um, this is the second pair. The dummy player is just going to take these. This was an extra victory point, And this is basically a resource that can stand in for a uh, regular ag or agriculture resource, whenever you want. So the dummy player just took both of those. Gone. All right, so, uh, and these are not going to refill until, the, until I reach my childhood. All right, so that was that. And now, well, again, there is no choice. I Normally, I would say that either the black or the yellow space would get blocked, and that means the dummy player or the trader would do the other thing. But remember, all the yellows are already blocked, so he can't do that. So that means he is going to block... A black worker placement spot. So there's less justice available because of the trader. And he's going to do another royalty action. Which means he's made it up here. He has now got his own five-point burial chamber. All right. So that was it for the second turn for the trader. As they work their way up their traitorous track. Okay, my third turn. Now, what am I going to do? 
hey, I've got some justice now. I could come over here and get an offering. So um, to, to, to get an offering, you just have to spend one. So whatever you've spent to get in is what you're going to spend. But if you can do a matching one, if you can do a pair, you get one of these plus an additional one. Uh, or if you don't like any of these, you can just draw a blind from the bag and hopefully get more of these resources. So... Now that I've got some justice in my back pocket, do I want to turn that justice into trade? And this is a wild card that can always stand in for visiting scribes. Doesn't matter what you have to pay to get in with scribes, this is basically a wild, but only towards scribes. Or I could get this, which is worth a point, and a trade. So I could do either of those. And, strictly speaking, if I then gave up another silver to match mine, then I could grab one of these as well. Don't think I want to do that. And in fact... I think I'm done. I could keep going. I've also got this red. But again, remember, the red isn't going to do me any good because I need one of each color. I mean, actually, I could do it. I could get a scribe. Or, I'm sorry, a noble. The red plus the black plus all three of my silver, and I could get a noble in the first round. That would be a pretty big move. That would be a huge move. Um, let's see. Let's look at what the nobles are that are available right now. Numbers 1, 2, and 3. Are any of them worth me completely bankrupting my baby self? So, this one is worth 12 points at the end of the game and gives me a permanent ability, which is to say, in the future, if I ever try to recruit nobles, I can use any five. They don't have to be five unique. They could be any five. This one, no points. An immediate benefit of giving me a scribe and a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, an, an offering. This one, 10 points. It's a permanent power. Whenever I go to the Nile. Let's see, I'm not quite sure what this one is. There is a handy... Oh, so, oh that's the... Uh, Alright, let's look at that one. Where are you, mister? We have a nice little two-page thing that summarizes them all, if I can find it. Right, that is... Right, that, that is the um, governor. Let's put these other two back. Come here, you. Come here, you. Where are you? Was it the governor? You are Nile to do this. Okay, yeah. Once per turn, you can uh, take an offering on the uh, on the Nile if there is no available spot left. So basically, it means that even oh oh no no I'm looking at the wrong one. I'm looking at the wrong one. That's the one with the plus. I need the other type. Do do do. Oh, here we go. Yes, yes. That is it's the the chief of Attics, I suppose. Right. The resource, right. Uh, on indicate area, you can always pay any resource of your choice on the wheel for access. So, yeah, you know, I, I can visit the Nile without having to spend blue. I could get in there with anything. If, and, and that's for the whole game. So it makes it easier for me to get to the Nile and at 10 points at the end of the game. So I could get one of those nobles and I'd completely bankrupt myself. And I now I know, starting in the next round, I'm going to have two construction and a justice or a construction a justice, and a trade. And... Ugh. But yeah, that's not going to pay... Because also, I remember, I, I know that the wheel is going to move. So if I get these, hey, I could get in here, but I wouldn't have the uh, nobility I would need because I'm not going to get it. I do have everything. I think that's too dire. I, I would pretty much completely bankrupt myself. So, instead of doing an action, instead of getting a a noble, or instead of getting an offering, or instead of using these wilds to go wherever I want, I'm going to pass. Uh, and because I'm the first to pass, I grab the first player marker, if I didn't already have it. Of course, I do have it, so I'm going to be first player in the next round. And now I am out, but only kind of. Hey, it's it's good to be the, uh, the son of a pharaoh, because even when I'm not doing anything, good stuff is still happening to me, as you'll see on my next turn. Because even though I pass, I still get to take turns. So, um, and I know I'm going to get to do this for a while because the trader is still has three more turns they're going to take before they're done. Let's see what the trader has up their sleeve. Alrighty. They want to do yet another uh, nobility, which is uh, get rid of the cheapest... Or no, I'm sorry, the most expensive one. So say goodbye to Scribe, who is worth 10 points. And um, get rid of noble number one. Alright, so they're just... Everybody's getting assassinated. Alrighty, and so now, so now it's interesting. I'm not, I'm not going anymore. So I don't care what gets blocked. So, but I do care about is which of these other actions do I want the trader to do? This would be, um, they would get. Oh, which one is that? Got to look up their list of powers. Right, that is the trader moves one space 
up on one of the tracks of the Nile. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So the trader would get to go up one on the Nile. And I believe it's the... Uh, a corresponding to the color of their most full trader. So they would move up on the yellow track. Did I go up on the yellow track? Yes, I did. I forgot to do it. There we go. Because I did go there. And that's how I got... Right, right, right. Yeah, so. All right. So um, if I do that, they're going to start working their way up there as well. And it's just to score points. If I if I let them do the, their trade action, if I let them do their justice action, that means... Every noble they collect, they haven't collected any nobles yet. So far, the trader's just been assassinating them, but eventually the trader will start um, killing them. And this means those nobles are worth seven points to the trader if I let that go up. And it goes up to eight, and nine, and ten, and eleven. And then they get a noble if they make it all the way to the top. So, which one am I going to let this traitorous trader trait? I think... Um, Let's put. Let's cover up a black. Let's try to keep this from happening, if at all possible. So they cover up a worker placement spot. No big. I don't mind that. And then they do a blue action, which means they go up once on their best track, which is over here. Okay. Boom. So that was it for them. It is now my turn again. I've already passed, so I can't do anything, except I totally can, because if we look a little bit more closely at this pyramid... I now get to move forward. Every turn, where if, if you pass early, you have the opportunity to get a resource of your choice, other than silver, then to get a silver, then to get something from the offering plate, and then another thing from the offerings. So, I get a resource of my choosing now. And the longer my opponent goes, whether it's a human player or the trader, the more stuff I tend to get. So this is a really interesting element of this game, that you're actively encouraged to pay big but then pass as fast as you can because you can get a good uh, payday even if you're relaxing because uh, you're not doing anything more for the round. So which resource do I want? Let's see. Um, oh, I know uh, exactly what I want. I'm going to take some royalty because I know next turn this is going to rotate over here and then I'm going to need a red and a yellow. So now I've got my yellow. Boom. Thanks. Trader, keep on trading. So Trader says I'm moving up on blue. And now he wants to do his weakest, which is black. There we go. And I get to choose. Does he move up on black? Again, I'm trying to stop that, so I'll have him move up on green and block a justice space. So now he cannot fill any of these anymore, um, the same way he couldn't fill any of those. And we did this green. He eliminated the weakest scribe. So obviously this is just replicating having a group of other players who are constantly grabbing scribes and stuff like that. Okay, so that was it for him. My turn again, and I get a sweet, sweet silver. Oh, baby. I am... Uh, next round is going to be very good. My uh, my terrible twos are going to be... Well, actually, I guess that's me as a young preteen, and then a teen, and then an adult, and then dead. <laughs> um, oh, okay. All right, so... Uh, I, I got a silver, and now this is going to be his last turn. He's going to be done after this. He moves up on his green track, which means he assassinates uh, number three. And then, is he going to move up on blue? Again, I'm trying to stop him from getting bonus points, although he hasn't even gotten any. But eventually, he is going to start getting up some. Yeah, I'll just have him do... A, oh, no, but I can't. Remember, if I say he wants to do the blue, then that means black. he cannot cover the black. So, it's too late. He's now going to do the blue. The black moves up, and now, if he gets any um, nobles, there were seven points a pop, and that was it for him. And it's my turn. I get to go again, and I get to partake of the offerings. Not these pairs of offerings, but I can take any one of these. If I don't like any of these, or if there just aren't any, then I could just draw blind and hope for the best. So... This is a wild card for um, visiting... Oh, for, for getting future... Uh, what do you call them? F future offerings. This is a construction. This is a justice. What the heck? Let's go on ahead and get the wild card. That'll be handy dandy. So I've snagged that for myself. It's his turn. He has passed. So, uh, which is to say, he just goes on ahead. And now that everybody's passed, I come over here. I hold on to first player. And we are ready to go on to round two. So what happens? As you might imagine, I talked about this before. Suddenly, the cost of entry just changed. But fortunately, I was planning for that. Because I know the red and the yellow are going to work good for me to get over there. And now I've got all these wild cards, etc., etc. And, um, oh, by the way, I'm sorry. I should have done this immediately. Folks, this is why you watch with the Klingon subtitles turned on, because I'm sure Apollo noted that as soon as I had passed, I should have taken one of these. And I think I took the one that gave me more flexibility. Bippity, boppity, 
Boo. So as, if there were other human players, as other players would pass, they would snag one. And eventually, once all players have passed, the last one remaining blocks areas off. So there is not going to be much burial chamber business going on in the second round. All right, oh, we got to clear all the old ones out. Put new ones in, of course. Bippity boppity bippity boppity boop. So this round, uh, there's two opportunities to visit the uh, nobles. One, only one opportunity to get in with the burial chambers. And how fortunate that I'm first, because that is what I will immediately do. So I paid the red. I need to also pay the yellow. And I've now got a burial chamber as well. It's only worth five points, but it's a start. And that was my turn. Let's see. Oh, we're moving on to around. So he has three. So I know in this second round, the trader is going to pass very quickly. They're just going to do three actions. So if I want to get more freebies, I need to pass sooner than him. And these are the kind of considerations you'd have when you're playing against a human player as well. So the trader says, hmm, I'm going to move up on my red. I'm not construction, which means he takes... Oh, oops, I should have refilled these also. Forgot about that. Bip and bippity bop. Right, so he moved up on red, which means he took group number three, which are all, you know, having leftover resources are worth points to him, the same as they are to me. And what uh, is, is he going to block green or black? So if he does green, that means he moves up on his best track, which will actually be green, because green will be the tallest. So he'll start working on that track, which, hey, that means he won't get three points. If I give him uh, black, that means... Okay, well, either way, whether it's green or black, he is going to move up one on his best track. So let's go on ahead and have him block black. So that's one less opportunity to visit. And he moves up on green, which and green is his best, so he moves up on the green track. And that's it for Mr. Trader. It's my turn again. I got a whole bunch of stuff. I cannot do burial chamber stuff anymore. I've got so much stuff. I think it might be time, especially since I've only got one more opportunity to visit the, uh, the nobles. Speaking of which, by the way, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. There was one other thing I was supposed to do as part of setup. In addition to ensuring I had a starting jar, and by the way, there should be two jars out here now, so that I know what I could potentially get once I pass. As part of setup, I was supposed to draw two noble cards, pick one for myself, and the other one goes away. But in this case, I pick one for myself, and the other one goes to the trader. So from the get-go, I have had access to one of those nobles. Again, Klingon subtitles, Paolo would have pointed that out to you. So which one did I want retroactively? Let's uh, see. This one's worth 10 points, worth 12 points. This one uh, means I can always get into the offerings. This one means I go. So either way, I, I have an easier time getting into the nobles, or I have an easier time getting into the offerings. It's a permanent ability for the rest of the game. Which one of those do I want? Uh, I'll take the offerings. I'll take the offerings. Because it's just worth two point, 12 instead of 10. So he already has one noble up, and we know that noble is worth seven points to him. But it could be up to eight, or nine, or ten, or twelve, depending on how high he moves up. Sorry, I totally forgot that as part of setup. But anyway, though, I'm going to get me a noble, gosh darn it. And which one of these fine folks? Alrighty. So, oh, all three of them are just instant. They won't give me an ongoing ability. This one gives me four points, and I immediately move up on two tracks, and I get two um, offerings. This one... I get a scribe, uh, which is nice. It's pretty expensive to get a scribe and an offering. Or this one, I get a scribe and another wild card. So I'm going to take one of these three. But to do it, I will have to pay bitterly. So I paid a black. And so there's my blue. And there's my red. So I need a yellow and a green, which means two of my wilds. So that means, uh, you know, I, that means I paid everything. I can grab one of these. And you might think, well, why would I do that? Because I want to get into a position where I want to pass as soon as possible. So if I make a really big extravagant spend like this, burning a couple of my wilds, and I pass before he does, I'll start getting resources uh, while he continues to play. So that might be why I'd want to do it. That is, if I want to chase after these particular nobles. So what am I going to? I don't know, folks, and I think I'm going to stop right there because that should give you a pretty good idea of what Farron is all about. And if you want to hear some final thoughts, you can hit that I in the top right corner screen or follow the show notes in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1.